All right. Our centering words from today is from the first Corinthians. It says, love God and trust that you are known by God. The musical meditation today is immortal, invisible, God only wise. The final lyrics are thy great name we praise. Karen Duggan is our liturgist today. She has the call to worship for us. Praise God who loves us all. Praise God who is full of mercy and compassion. Praise God who loves us well. Praise God who creates honesty and justice. Praise God who invites us to love. Praise God who loves us through our actions and loves through us and our actions. John and Megan will lead us through all glory, laud and honor. Psalm 111, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord. 
studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Bella Barrett agreed to record a song on piano for our service today, and it's entitled Pastoral. Good morning. Uh, I will be uh, bringing to you here in just a, a second uh, the pastoral prayer. Uh, I'll be reading to you a prayer from um, the Book of Common Worship for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. And then we'll get into the prayers of the people and then the Lord's Prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, we lift up to you these supplications of your people that it talks about in this prayer, this wonderful prayer that uh, dates back for ages. Lord, we have several folks here in our uh, church family that are, are hurting, who need a special touch from you uh, for their health, Lord. You know who those folks are, Lord, and I think most of us do, Lord, that uh, we lift them up to you for strength and assurance that let you know let them know that you are with them lord god we lift up kathy's niece amber to you that has uh, undergone surgery for uh, cancer lord uh, we lift her up to you that you would touch her in a mighty way we lift up uh craig and marilyn newton as they lost their son Jeremiah tragically, Lord. We lift that family up to you that you would minister to them 
and help to heal a hurt that um, the, the overriding question I know that has to be in their mind is why Lord? And there may not be a good answer, Lord. So help them to see the way to the cross through all of this. And for John Williams' brother, uh, brother's family, Richard Williams, in their time of loss and their time of grief, we lift them up to you here this day. We pray these things in the name of your son who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I think now is the time that we uh, jump into the sermon scripture and uh, let's see here we go they went this the sermon scripture is from mark chapter 1 verses 21 through 28 they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm guessing you probably hear in the background, uh, my dog is barking. She's downstairs in the basement, and uh, she just hears my voice, and she wants to be with me. Don't get disturbed thinking that that may be an unclean spirit trying to speak this morning. Uh, she is really a very loving dog. So in this scripture here this morning, uh, Mark is leading up to this place uh, all during this first chapter. We see where uh, Jesus has been baptized and he's gone into the wilderness and he has gone about uh, recruiting his disciples. And now they're all together and they have gone to a town called Capernaum. Capernaum is a um, seaside town uh, on the Sea of Galilee. And I'm going to draw you a map. Uh, and it's in my artistic skills of where Capernaum is. Uh, I know it's going to astound you. OK. Hopefully you can see this. It's actually in reverse, but this is the Sea of Galilee. I think it's somewhat like eight miles wide, 13 miles 
up and down, uh, north and south. And Capernaum, now from what you're seeing, you're probably seeing this as on the north uh, east corner, but actually it's in reverse. It's up here on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. So, so this is where Jesus has chosen to start to launch his earthly ministry. And so there is no better place to start his earthly ministry than in the synagogue. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about the synagogue. Uh, it's different than the temple. There was only one temple, and that was in Jerusalem. In the temple, that's where uh, the worship and sacrifices are made, and um, the rabbis uh, teach there. But the synagogues, so, well, so the temple is all about having church. Well, the synagogue is all about having church. Sunday school, if you will, or discipleship ministry, because wherever there was a collection uh, or a community of Jewish folks, there was a synagogue. The synagogue consisted of the ruler. He was basically the administrative chief of the synagogue. Uh, then there was um, the ones that uh, distributed the alms, the ones who collected the money and uh, distributed it out to the poor and the needy. Uh, and um, there were the scribes who interpreted the Torah or the law, uh, and they would they would basically um, just talk about the scriptures. And so the synagogue is where basically three things happen. Prayer, uh, the reading of God's word, and the exposition of God's word. Basically, someone who would give a sermon. So it was the ruler of the synagogue's job to find someone. You didn't have to go to seminary. You didn't have to go... You didn't have to be anyone special, just someone who is learned in, in the law. It's, it, and so it was the ruler's job to find someone to preach on the Sabbath. Uh, and I think the qualifications were basically you were raised in the Jewish faith. Think of it this way. Our own Dick Hoadley, uh, every Sunday, tries to find someone who will be liturgist. So it's a lot like that. Thank you, Dick, for helping us do that. And thank you, Karen, this morning for serving as liturgist. So this is what happens in the synagogue. Okay, so here comes Jesus along and his disciples, and this is the place where they have decided they're going to launch, Jesus is going to launch his earthly ministry. So he gets up to preach, and everyone is amazed at the way he preached. Because the scribes, the way that they would interpret the law is they would quote this prophet or that prophet. They never really ever spoke as having authority. They didn't speak, they didn't preach as really knowing, but this is what the scribes did, is they, they would just say what they think the scripture means. But here comes Jesus, and he preaches to them with authority, because see, he is the voice of God, and uh, his words have penetrated their hearts, and their minds, and they have never, ever had anyone preach to them like that before. So here they ask the question is, what is this, uh, a new teaching? Ah, but then there's this uh, 
man that they believe to be filled with a demon, an unclean spirit. Uh, let's see if I can go back here in scriptures and mine out uh, what they uh, said about him. Uh, he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. What drama that was. <laughs> Can you imagine something like that happening in our church service today? Uh, I think it might be a good way to get your preacher drummed out. <laughs> if we started pointing fingers and saying, demon, come out. No. Uh, there, the ancient thinking of demons is different, I believe, than what it is today. See, in Jesus' time, uh, and for many generations after that, because they didn't really understand modern science with regard to Satan, they believed that anyone who was sick was filled with a demon. We know that that's not to be true today. But that was their understanding. So what is our understanding of an unclean spirit or of a demon? Well, the ancient Hebrew word for demon uh, is mazahim, M-A-Z-Z-A-H-I-M, which means one who does harm. Demons were thought then, and I kind of believe that uh, uh, it's the same understanding today, only in different circumstances. Demons are thought to be malignant beings intermediate between God and man who are out to work men harm, or out to do harm to men. I think today, demonic activity exists not not like i don't believe that it's the same as in jesus's understanding who knows maybe maybe sickness and disease is demonic activity but that doesn't mean someone who's sick is filled with the demon it's just that you know god is the author of life and health and so who would be the author of uh sin, sickness, and disease, the origins, uh, I think, are as old as creation itself with the serpent in the garden. I believe today demonic activity exists wherever there is evil, wherever there is evil that is meant to harm mankind. I think we see demonic activity in things like human trafficking and um, uh, drug trafficking and uh, those types of things that are not of God, but yet there is evil in the world that exists. Now, you have to be careful with this because you can't be as... Uh, uh, what I've heard my dad say, see a demon behind every bush. That's not the way it is, but there is evil that, that uh, lurks about, and it lurks in the uh, about in the hearts and minds of evil people. So don't go around shaking your finger at people and saying, demon, come out. I don't believe that that's what God would be having us do. But yet in the scripture, it talks about how Jesus spoke to that demon with authority. Now, mind you, Jesus is the Logos word, the living word of God. And when he speaks, 
he spoke with authority. In Luke chapter 2, excuse me, Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, the, uh, the scripture says, Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Folks, whenever we see evil in the world, and uh, don't be so quick to, if you see something, to say something on Facebook. Uh, and because you need to really understand, you know, the scripture talks about discerning of the spirits. You really need to know whether or not that that is the type of evil that lurks about in the world. Uh, and God gives you the ability, the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to discern those spirits. But we have the ability through Jesus's promise here that we can take his word and we can speak to that evil. And I believe that it will limit evil's work in the world. You know, in our baptismal vows, we talk about uh, in our profession of faith is that we renounce the forces of wickedness and evil in the world. I believe that we have God's word, especially folks, those scriptures in your Bible that are in red, those scriptures speak with authority. To whatever evil is in the world. It's my hope and desire that you speak words of life and health uh, into the lives of people and that you speak God's word to limit those things of evil activity that goes on in the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our next hymn is, hold on, I'm getting it right here. Have thine own way, Lord. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Praise God. And I want to thank you all this morning for attending here uh, and uh, being with us. 
We know it's not an ideal way, but it's the next best thing that we can fellowship together here on Zoom. And uh, again, I want to take just uh, a couple of seconds to uh, talk about our giving. Uh, I And again, I appreciate your faithfulness and your giving. As some of you have read in my e-note uh, yesterday, I've come up with this big idea. And uh, it was basically, we had a church member come to us uh, last uh, summer and said, you know, I really don't need this stimulus check. And uh, this person gave uh, some money, gave his st stimulus check basically to buy gift cards uh, at Hy-Vee and uh, Fairway for those who really need some groceries. Well, Becky and I, we got our stimulus check here again this, this uh, last week. And, you know, wow, it's just like a, a bonus. There's a lot of folks out there that need that stimulus check, though, because it means paying rent paying utilities, being able to buy groceries, just the basic necessities of life. So over and above our regular giving, I'm proposing that to you to prayerfully consider tithing off of that stimulus check to our, uh, to our life fund. The life fund we uh, depleted here a couple of years ago because of financial issues with the church. And so now I would like to refund that so that we can really do some good uh, for folks. And, and I don't have a perfect formula as to where that money is gonna be going. Part of it may go, go uh, from the life fund to our food pantry. If they have specific needs, uh, we may support some other uh, organizations in the community that can actually uh, have a direct uh, influence uh, on having, uh, on helping people uh, that they know what the needs are. Uh, but anyway, 10% of that stimulus check for each one of us is 60 bucks. And so for a couple, it would be 120 bucks. You know, you can go out and spend it on, on yourself if you want to. And God only requires 10%. They don't require the whole thing. Uh, but prayerfully consider what God would have you do. And so now with that commercial, uh, I would like to offer an offertory prayer and our benediction. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your tithes and our offerings. Lord, we thank you that you uh, have action in people's lives in the world, Lord. Help us to be faithful, continue stewards of your money that comes into the church that we might be able to bless people and to worship you, Lord God. And now, uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.